This program is brought to you by Emory University. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon, welcome to our Family Forum series. It's a great privilege to see all of you here. Thank you very much for coming. My name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Religion, the sponsor of today's proceedings. Our center is dedicated to the study of some of the religious sources and dimensions of cardinal issues at the intersection of law, politics, and society. We pursue our work through a series of advanced research projects, seminars, courses, publications, and public forums such as this one. This year's Family Forum series is focused on issues of children. From this lectern, we have addressed hard issues ranging from the disposition of unwanted frozen embryos to the wisdom and folly of corporal child discipline to the immense challenges posed by adolescent sex rape, and violence. We have also analyzed various responses by church and state authorities to the grim plight of children in America today. Issues ranging from the constitutional propriety of faith-based initiatives for impoverished children to the institutional priority of church-based action in African American communities unusually decimated by the breakdown of traditional family structures. Today we address some of the hard legal and cultural intricacies of affirmative action in education. Is affirmative action an enlightened and long overdue rebuke to the savagery and ravages of racism, slavery, poverty, and hierarchy, as Justice Thurgood Marshall once called it? Or is affirmative action a bulwark and a badge of inferiority that breeds dangerous dependencies and false entitlements? as Justice Clarence Thomas recently indicated. Is affirmative action a courageous and innovative legal experiment designed to create new diversities in our cultures, our classrooms, our canons? If so, how long should the experiment last? Whom should it serve? By what scales should we measure its success or failure? These are among the hard questions that our speaker today has addressed with great acuity and alacrity over the past two decades and more. It's a privilege indeed to welcome to this lectern Emory's new provost, Professor Dr. Earl Lewis. Provost Lewis is a distinguished historian of African American life and culture. From 1984 to 1989, he taught at the University of California at Berkeley in its African American Studies Department. From there, he moved to the University of Michigan, where he served as a chaired professor and as director of the Michigan Afro-American and African Studies Department. From there, he moved to become Michigan's vice provost and dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Happily, last summer, the South beckoned, and Dr. Lewis answered. And he is now completing his first year as provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at Emory University. He has already taken this institution by intellectual storm. Provost Lewis has published scores of articles and seven monographs, including his recent award-winning title from Oxford University Press, To Make Our World Anew, A History of African Americans. He is co-editor of the 11-volume Young Oxford History of African Americans. His most recent title, Defending Diversity, Affirmative Action at the University of Michigan. This volume provides a unique insider's look and something of an apologia for the Supreme Court's most recent case on affirmative action, Grutter versus Bollinger, which upheld the University of Michigan Law School's affirmative action program. It is that topic which will occupy Provost Lewis today. He will offer us 30 or 40 minutes of remarks after the applause dies down, finally, he will then take questions from the floor. Will you please join me in offering a very warm welcome to our colleague, our leader, our teacher, Provost Lewis.
think it is officially afternoon, so good afternoon, everyone. And thank you. When I accepted the invitation and John said he was teaching a class in con law and, I, and would I come and talk to his class, I said, uh, sure. And then I realized this probably is the largest class in the, the law school. <laughs> and no, I mean, in all seriousness, I came to realize that this is an opportunity to talk about a, a larger topic to a broad cross-section. And I hope what we can do and achieve this afternoon is to do several things. One, let me lay out an argument and see what you think of it. And then two, let's respond and have a dialogue and a conversation. As was noted, I was on the faculty at the University of Michigan for 15 years. And I played a variety of roles. Um, from faculty member to director of the Center for Afro-American and African Studies uh, to roles in the history department and then ultimately vice provost and dean of the graduate school. At one point during the, uh, that period, uh, Lee Bollinger, who was then president of the university, and Nancy Cantor, who was then provost of the university, came and asked me would I lead an effort at Michigan on what we ended up calling diversity dialogues, the ability to actually deal with the moment of when the nation was shining a spotlight on the institution intensely about diversity and affirmative action and it made sure that the community itself didn't implode and explode uh, as a result knowing that that kind of intense scrutiny for a long period of time in and of itself uh, could be very devastating as individuals began to live out and deal with the consequences of being in a spotlight for a number of years. So what I want to talk about today is the future of affirmative action. Uh, and ask the question, can it survive? And this is an odd role for a historian trying to predict the future. Uh, there are others in this room and across the street, particularly in the business school, that bank on the fact that they can predict the futures from the stock market to other areas of life, and sometimes they even win. As a historian, we do better with the fact that um, we look at the past because we know that the past is not always a really sharp predictor of the future. But anyway, let's, let's engage in a conversation. Many in higher education viewed the Supreme Court decision on July 23, 2003 in both the Gratz versus Bollinger and Grutter versus Bollinger cases as an overall victory. In, the, in those cases, the Supreme Court upheld the principle that state institutions had a compelling interest in creating a racially and ethnically diverse class. Headlines the next, in the next day's newspaper suggested what many sensed and hoped. One headline read, Colleges Relieved. Another headline read, U of Michigan ruling endorses the value of campus diversity. Michigan's cases and its defense of his actions turned on the diversity argument rather than a frontal support of affirmative action. As a result, the tilt toward the diversity argument ironically exposes affirmative action to a somewhat perilous fate, a prospect many opponents no doubt invite and cherish. I don't know how many of you actually read either of the two cases in their entirety, but neither, insofar as I have been able to detect, ever used a phrase affirmative action. Why? Affirmative action, classically defined, has come to mean, according to social psychologist Faye Crosby, and I'm quoting here, the expenditure of energy or resources by an organization in a quest for equality among individuals from different discernible groups. This definition has long been accepted by policymakers from both political parties. It bestowed the tools to monitor change by race, gender, nationality, and a number of other variables. At its core, affirmative action, in my view, has been a moderate social policy since it enabled institutions to put into place plans for improving opportunities for racial minorities, women, and others. And this is a principle that the court, the Supreme Court, maintained in the two Michigan Supreme Court cases. Affirmative action, therefore, has been more about offering solutions to members of groups rather than individuals, although, on average, the remedies befall individuals from these specific groups. By contrast, and by contrast I mean, by contrast, equal opportunity provisions have been routinely interpreted to mean benefits that redound to specific individuals who may be members of protected groups or categories. And the tension between affirmative action and equal protection is always, and equal opportunity is one of those ones that is written into both social policy and social commentary as well as into law. But from the beginning, reflecting both an intellectual rationale 
and a political compromise, the University of Michigan decided to defend diversity instead of affirmative action. And so here I'm speaking both as an academic historian and an insider uh, and, and when I make that point. Michigan's leadership, among them the president, provost, and regents, believed that the real issue was diversity, intellectual diversity as well as racial and ethnic diversity. After all, when first Jennifer Gratz and Patrick Almaker sued the undergraduate college and the university's leadership, and then Barbara Gruder sued the law school and the campus leaders, the undergraduate admissions office's office had a complex, multi-dimensional formula that it used to decide the makeup of its freshman class. The formula allowed for a maximum of 150 points. The majority of points derived from purely academic factors, such as GPA, class standing, the rigor of a high school curriculum, including the number of AP courses at one school and the number taken by the student test scores, and other merit-based factors. Students also received points if their relatives had graduated from the university legacy, they, or if they lived in rural settings, played an instrument well, or were athletes. Points also went to students, irrespective of race, who attended schools in socially economically disadvantaged areas, to young women who intended to major in areas in which they were underrepresented and for race, racial, and ethnic membership. That is, if you were black, Latino, or Native American. From the late 19th century, <clears throat> university leaders had steadfastly argued that ensuring a diverse class stemmed from the mission of the school to provide an uncommon education for the common person. So on the one hand, the diversity argument had very deep roots in Michigan and at the University of Michigan. And I should know parenthetically, of course, the law school had a different argument. Their argument was not about intellectual diversity in the sense of being able to mass a class along a long, complex list of variables in the formula. They argued that diversity was critical be and because it was a question of critical mass, that the only way to ensure an intellectually diverse class is to make sure that you have representation from a broad spectrum of individuals. And that at some point, if you didn't have enough, and then individuals who were in a minority would feel silenced in the context of that classroom and hence be inhibited in the educational environment. And as a result, the university and the students who matriculated in the law school would not benefit in the fullest sense from a diverse learning environment. Going back to the diversity argument, it was also the case that the diversity argument worked well in the political environment of the 1990s. And we shouldn't lose sight of this. I'm a social historian. After a period of democratic control of the governor's mansion, as well as both chambers of the state legislature, the Republican Party in the state of Michigan regained control with the election of John Engler as governor. Engler's people sent word that they would not challenge the university's endorsement of a diversity rationale as long as the issue didn't become affirmative action. Although enjoying bipartisan support at one level, the, poly, uh, the party understood that the relationship between race and affirmative action had potentially explosive consequences for the party and its fortunes. This is the Republican Party I'm speaking of. If the issue became affirmative action, many in the more conservative western part of the state may become mobilized, some feared, thereby pitting the party, growing in influence statewide, but still in a minority against an equally mobilized labor and civil rights coalition. And so the question here became, how did you win? Recognizing this is a trade, if you mobilize your forces, you're most likely to also mobilize the opposition. And in the context of Michigan, then the stakes were high if your goal was to control both chambers of the state legislature. And as a result then, the argument was is then we will allow a diversity argument to stay, come forth. The Republican Party will indeed support the university in that sense. It would not oppose it, but the argument had to be diversity and not affirmative action. However, not all members of the Republican Party in the state of Michigan uh, were agreed to be, partake in this deal. Three state legislators, led by University of Michigan graduate David Jay, 
placed ads in newspapers across the state, seeking any white student who believed they had been denied admission to the University of Michigan due to their race. These ads produced 500 names, according to most published accounts. From that group of 500, the Center for Individual Rights, a Washington-based social action group, settled on the three whose names now grace future constitutional history texts forever. Gratz, Amaker, and Gruder. And so when you think of it then, and you realize that oftentimes when you read this case and in good con law books, you, you get all of this, but there's a lot of politics in the background that were influencing the ways in which we got these cases, who participated, who were the faces that we saw, and for those of you who watched 60 Minute uh, pieces, and, and why they looked the way they did. The result was is that on October 14, 1997, Grotz and others versus Bollinger and others uh, was submitted and filed in the U.S. District Court in the Eastern District of Michigan. A little over a month later, December 3rd, 1997, Gruder versus Bollinger was also filed in the Eastern District. Then the story gets really interesting because on February 5th, 1998, there was a motion to intervene in the Gratz case filed by high school students of color in the state of Michigan and their parents. It's a group called Citizens for Affirmative Action Preservation. They were joined by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the American Civil Liberties Union Foundation, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. They all wanted to intervene, believing that the University of Michigan had a history of racial discrimination and that in its own defense, it would never bring forth evidence that it had a history of racial discrimination and that the only way for this to come out is then for standing by third party interveners. The motion to intervene was denied by the district courts. This would continue again and they would resubmit the same motion to intervene in the Gruder case. This was filed on March 26, 1998. Again, the motion to intervene was denied. August 10, 1999, a year later, and you realize how long this process before we get to 2003. August 10, 1999, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the trial court's order and allowed intervention in both cases. Both courts then allowed additional time for discovery and the case was delayed for another year. Between July and October of 2000, and that another group intervenes, this time Americans' corporate sector. General Motors would lead then a series of amici briefs that would be filed on behalf of Fortune 500 corporations in support of the diversity rationale put forth by the University of Michigan, arguing that the value of a diverse workforce was important to the future of American corporate interests and American economic might. In fact, between July of 2000 and February of 2003, 74 amici briefs will be filed with the U.S. Supreme Court and other layers of the U.S. Uh, court system. And they will come from scores of organizations, professional associations, universities including Emory, colleges, law schools, Fortune 500, and more than 14,000 law school students and other individuals. Oral arguments will be held on November 16th in 2000 in the Gratz case. And what was interesting in this case is that the Center for Individual Rights conceded one important point. It conceded that all students admitted to the University of Michigan under its affirmative action plan and procedures, that all of those students were qualified. So it was not a question of whether or not unqualified students had replaced more qualified students. The Center for Individual Rights conceded all the students who had been admitted were qualified. The question really for the Center for Individual Rights is whether race should be a variable in the admissions process at all. That really was a fundamental question that I, at least I argued, and you would see it played out.
they also decided to waive a trial, and they went to sort of a summary judgment. Judge Duggan, or Dugan issued his opinion in the Gratz case on December 13th in 2000 that the undergraduate admissions program is constitutional under Bakke since it is narrowly tailored and because diversity in higher education serves a compelling governmental interest. So it was interesting that at the district court level, where it was decided, the judge decided that it was narrowly tailored and it was constitutional. He did rule, however, he being Dugan, did rule that the admissions program that was in effect between 1995 and 98, which was more formulaic, was unconstitutional. So he made a divide that the changes that had been made since uh, Gratz and Amaker filed suit were more in keeping with the court understanding in Bakke. At the same time, December 22nd in 2000, Judge Friedman would hear oral arguments and in the Grutter case. He decides, however, to hold a limited trial. He initially, they, in, as in the undergraduate case, they sought uh, for a summary judgment, but he decided to have a limited trial. That trial would run through February of 2001, and there would be numerous individuals who would play a role in that trial. This is all part of the background that leads up then to the April 1st, uh, 2003 Supreme Court. Because what will happen, of course, is that both cases, the undergraduate case would be, have been decided at a district level. The Judge Freeman would decide in favor, um, and, and that case would be appealed to the appellate level. And, and from there, it would make its way all the way to the Supreme Court. In fact, both cases would, in the end, be consolidated. Provide his background because the joke, of course, at Michigan in that we would have a Supreme Court hearing on April Fool's Day uh, was in and of itself a bad omen uh, uh, of things to come. You weren't exactly sure how to make, what to make of the tea leaves there. But when the decision came then and came forth, you realized that we were at a different point in American constitutional history when you're trying to figure out the very thorny issue of how to deal with race in American life. There was a decision and there was much conversation as part of the strategy in that if we were going to win this case when we were at Michigan, there was only one, there was one primary justice to speak to, Sandra Day O'Connor. From 1997 until 2003, there was a general consensus that the pivot swing vote in this case would be Sandra Day O'Connor. And that part of devising a legal strategy meant figuring out a strategy that would be heard by Sandra Day O'Connor. And in the end, it proved to be the case and that she became the most important voice in understanding and approving of the procedures that had been adopted for an in diversity argument. Michigan will go on to argue, and this is the piece, that diversity had then both educational outcomes and democracy outcomes. It was about education and democracy. So a series of social science studies completed by a range of social psychologists, including my, my friend and colleague, Pat Gurn, went back to look at what happens to young people in learning environments in which there are people of different racial, ethnic, religious backgrounds. And what we found, and what they found, is a series of educational outcomes. So students tended to participate more actively in class. They were measured on, on critical analysis and critical learning skills. They tended to have higher critical learning and critical analytical skills have been developed. They also tended to engage in, and interestingly enough, in external activities once they graduated. They tended to be unlike the whole notion of bowling alone. They tended to be involved in the community in critical ways. It was attributed to and argued that this was an important benefit of diversity. The same thing that was argued also at the law school, looking at what happens to law school graduates. Uh, how do they benefit from this learning environment? That all seemed to have been very, very important in the final analysis as one looked at and tried to understand the benefits of the Michigan approach to diversity and affirmative action. I say this in part because when you think about then the post-Gruder and Gratz environment, we're now at a point where we know the outcome, and I won't go through all blow by blow of, of narrow tailoring and strict scrutiny and all the other bits and pieces that you will be discussing elsewhere uh, here. But let's talk a little bit about the policy consequences of Grutter and Gratz. What does it mean for us at this particular point 
and for not only for the University of Michigan, but for other institution, institutions similarly situated. In the post gruder and Gross environment, what can we expect? First, I think we can expect renewed efforts by opponents to frame the issue as affirmative action and not diversity. I think for all the efforts by the University of Michigan to say this is all about diversity, I think in a post gruder and Gross environment, there will be renewed efforts to frame the issue as affirmative action and not diversity. Affirmative action lends itself more readily to a narrative of unfairness. If you think of it, it lends itself more readily to a narrative of unfairness. After all, there is the assumption that a more qualified student is replaced by a lesser qualified student in the general narrative that has been constructed by, among others, Ward Conley, Shelby Steele, and Linda Chavez. And if you go through and systematically read what they have written, affirmative action is unfair because someone more qualified has been replaced. And so I think we can expect renewed efforts then to reframe, reframe the debate. Second, I think we can see, anticipate new methods of attack that in their practice limit the degree to which institutions will be able to pursue either standard affirmative action measures or new kinds of affirmative action measures. And let me see if I can explain this. In the months after Grutter and Grosser decided, the Center for Equal Opportunities, this uh, body, uh, scoured websites around the country, and they followed up their search on websites with letters to most major universities. And they threatened those universities. They told them that they would instigate investigations by the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education if they didn't expand their eligibility for summer research opportunity programs. And some of you actually may be aware of this. Now, on the surface, this may seem a reasonable response, open participation by all irrespective of race. But with the decline in international applicants to graduate programs due both to the negative consequences of immigration policy and intense competition abroad, targeting students of color for programs intended to interest them in graduate school may look more like sound social policy rather than a version of reverse discrimination. Here's a question about pool and who's available and how do we expand the domestic pool at a time that we're no longer able to attract as many international students as possible. The summer research opportunity programs had existed to do that very thing. Targeting in them may in one hand seem like an appropriate response in a Grutter and Gratz, post Grutter Gratz environment. But on the other hand, it also looks like and is a way to delimit the options under the broader heading of affirmative action. Third, the specter of lawsuits has led many universities, foundations, and other institutions to adopt practices that, see, that some, including me, see as a retreat. When the Ford Foundation and the Mellon Foundation, for instance, decided to expand eligibility for old programs, on the one hand, that makes sense if they're also expanding the budget. But if the budget is static and eligibility is expanded, you decrease then the availability for the groups that had always been part of the focus of their efforts to expand inclusion. It's a huge question right now bubbling across the American social and political landscape is how do you accomplish both tasks? How do you make sure in that you expand eligibility without diluting the focus of the programs in the first instance? Fourth, in a number of states, anti-affirmative action activists have mounted successful referenda campaigns. We think of California and Washington. Perhaps most noticeable is the attempt to get a ballot initiative on a 2006 uh, Michigan ballot that would ban the use of race and gender in employment, promotions, and college admissions. And this came after the Grutter and Gratz decision. It was led by Ward Conley, never in my mind ever a resident of the state of Michigan. He and his colleagues would call this effort the Civil Rights Initiative. 
One could say this is a devious play on words. One could say a few other things. <laughs> Fifth, I think in a Gruder and Gross environment, there's the ever real danger of what I call diversity fatigue. Diversity fatigue. Man, we've been there. We've done it. I'm tired of this. Can't we find another issue? It surely sat in at the University of Michigan in the months and days, days and months after Gruder and Graz was decided. There was a general, general malaise across campus. The institution had invested millions of dollars, had prevailed in the Supreme Court, and now couldn't it just be over? People were tired. They wanted to do something else. One of the ironies, I think, is that when we've modeled these kinds of efforts, be they for a generation or two, there is sort of this life cycle in terms of energy and focus, diversity, fatigue, that's set in across the country in many different ways. Finally, I would argue that the current focus on diversity rather than affirmative action has one other effect. Namely, the question of race and opportunity in American life gets tabled the question of race and opportunity in American life gets tabled. Statistics still show that life chances and expectations vary greatly by race and socioeconomic status. Is it possible, I ask, is it possible to have an honestly brokered conversation about race? And I'm not, I'm not so sure that we can. The historian in me wonders whether or not we can have an honestly brokered conversation about race. I'm not sure it was there in Gruder and Graz. I'm not sure that we will see it in the days and weeks ahead. I hope you can correct me. I hope you are more optimistic than I am. I'm not quite yet where Du Bois was in 1963, uh, but one begins to wonder whether or not there are certain topics that we just can't fully discuss in ways that allow us to work through the pros and cons of an argument. So, so that we make sure we have time for conversation. Let me put out a, a conclusion and in there, embedded in it, a question. In conclusion, the debate over affirmative action will survive. The debate over affirmative action will survive, as will the need to tap the diversity of intellectual talent across the country. There's every reason to believe that certain practices may end, not because they don't work and haven't been important. They will most likely end because the politics of race continue to outpace thoughtful conversation about social policy. Studies show that opinions about the efficacy of affirmative action vary greatly, depending more than anything on the ways in which investigators phrase the question. Series of studies. This manipulation poisons the moments for reasoned and detail-centered debates. As a result, in 25 years, the period most think the court is prepared to tolerate affirmative action in college admissions. Unless we take difficult steps in the K through 12 sector, the past will continue to haunt the present. If that proves correct, affirmative action will be likened to that 1960s daytime soap opera about vampires. Those of you who are old enough to remember, it was called Dark Shadows. Now, if you remember Dark Shadows, Barnabas was killed, his coffin nailed shut, but each time he managed to escape and live again. Many times he came back in a slightly modified form, never quite the same old Barnabas, although always recognizable in the end to friend and fall. Affirmative action may prove our dark shadows, that thing we cannot kill until we deal with the larger matter of race and opportunity in American life. In some ways, that's the larger story of Gruder and Graz. That's the lingering story of Gruder and Graz. That's the most important aspect of Gruder and Graz. The fact that we still have to deal not just with affirmative action, not just with a diversity, but the question of race and opportunity in the 21st century. 
that point, we all need to stand back and ask, even if affirmative action survives, what does it mean? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Provost. I think he deserves another round of applause for that fine set of remarks. It is time for an honestly brokered conversation on race, which the forums that we try to create in this auditorium under the auspices of our center are designed to do. And may I invite you uh, to put questions to the provost. If I could ask you please to use the microphones that are halfway through the auditorium and put your question with pithiness and profundity please, such that the provost can answer your question pithily and profoundly in return. Please, Mr. Ghosh. A few years ago, the state of Florida, in response to Ward Connerly's ballot initiative, uh, implemented the Talented 20 program. Do you believe that programs like that are a valid way to increase diversity in the uh, higher education? Because the University of Florida, the f following year after the implementation, did see a drop in minority enrollment, but since then it has been back on the upswing. Yeah, um, I've always had a problem with the, the sort of talented five or talented 20 or whatever percent program, one, at least at the undergraduate level, is predicated on segregation. And so you end up then dealing with this huge sort of social and ethical conundrum that you have to have sufficiently segregated housing patterns in the United States that then translate in sufficiently segregated schools to be able to identify then students uh, of certain backgrounds to get sufficient numbers into uh, universities and, and schools and colleges. I'm not sure as a country that we actually want to build social policy on the foundation of segregation. Thank you, Provost Lewis. Um, I'm appreciative of your reference to Du Bois and very recently heard Professor Lu Lucius Outlaw, who is um, Vice Provost at Vanderbilt and Professor of Philosophy. And his discussion um, centered around Tuckville's um, assessment of what he called the three races at that point um, in the U.S. As I, as I listened to the conversations about university level admissions and or successes, I'm, I'm hearing that from the student perspective. I would like to ask if you could speak to the phenomenon of the professoriate who are ill-prepared and sometimes antagonistic towards those very admittees? Sure. Um, it's a very, very difficult uh, issue because what we, what I recognize as provost that a lot of the change inside of the academy uh, comes from actually uh, dealing with colleagues, uh, faculty. We made the decisions, uh, particularly in uh, outside of undergraduate admissions, typically we made the decisions as to who actually will show up in a classroom uh, from one fall to another. It's usually a faculty admissions committee that is playing a, a very, very important role. One of the great challenges, and I should say, state parenthetically, I served for three years on the board of directors for the GRE, the graduate record exam. And what we struggled with there is, is that cognitive examinations in and of themselves only tell you a fraction of what you need to know about an individual uh, as we try to predict who sh should be admitted to a class. Uh, we spent three years while I was on the board trying to come up with non-cognitive factors. So for instance, when you're thinking about that and dealing with faculty, so the question becomes, if you're only looking at SA, L, LSAT scores and GPAs, or GREs and GPAs, or whatever, you still only account for 20, 53 to 57% of the variance. There's a lot of other things out there, from creativity to imagination to stick to itness to a whole range of other factors that predict success in these selective environments. And the debate over affirmative action is really a debate about access to the most selective institutions in the United States. I mean, we should be quite honest and clear about that. It's not about whether or not we're going to uh, enroll enough students in our classrooms. And in fact, we, in some places, in certain sectors, we have more seats than students. And that's why we have been able to secure talent from around the world. We've picked off the top one half of 1% of the world's population for the last 50 years. 
but in part because in certain areas we don't have enough representation here. And so it really is a debate about then admissions to places like Emory in the University of Michigan. And in that case then faculty play a very, very important role. The larger issue for us is then how do we begin to think through what it means to be successful? What is merit? How do we measure it? Are there multiple definitions? How do we look at the whole person in the admissions process? And that's the greatest challenge. How do we look at the whole person in the admissions process? Dr. Lewis, mm -hmm. you mentioned as a possible solution the aggressive intervention in K through 12. And there's, I think, a strong argument that this is likely to be as effective or more effective than affirmative action at the college or professional school level. Yet there doesn't seem to be the political will to implement this type of solution. Do you have any thoughts on why that's so? Um, I have a lot of thoughts. I, I, let's see if I can provide any light uh, here. I mean, I think part of the great challenge is the K through 12 education opportunities across the nation are evenly distributed. And so if you look at the resource bases from one state to another, one, it goes back to the basic system of taxation. The, what are the tax structures in states and how are those resources then redistributed? Using Detroit as an example, we knew at the University of Michigan that when we looked at both inner city Detroit uh, and some rural areas of the state of Michigan, they had three or four AP courses offered uh, to graduate students. In Ann Arbor, the public schools offer 27 AP courses. And so it would mean then changing the sort of allocation of resources in ways that are uncomfortable. No, no legislature, uh, no governor is going to step in and dictate to a municipality. There was an attempt in the 1980s and, and 1990s to level a playing field in part by redoing real estate taxes across the country and trying to figure out there in a way to sort of see if that would help to smooth out distribution of resources. It's mixed results in so far as I've been able to tell. So that's one piece. The second piece is about tenure of teachers inside of certain districts and, and, and who they are, how long they're tenured, what kind of resources they get. And that's a hard and thorny piece. The Gates Foundation is working with the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation for early college program, trying to work with universities to partner them with school districts around the country to begin to train school teachers in an effect to provide them with greater materials and credentials to assist in this problem. But it's quite systemic. And when you look at then dropout rates and a range of other factors, uh, it's a huge challenge. I'm not, I'm not convinced that the No Child Left Behind uh, platform is the best way to do it unless there's going to be federal dollars to support it. Uh, a lack of uh, monies appropriated by Congress means that what we have is an unfunded mandate. And some have argued in both directions. Uh, that there, is, there are indeed funds there, and you have governors arguing there's not enough funds there. The political will uh, will have to come from the people of the United States. And I think, in effect, we determine what our policymakers do. And so for those of you out here, um, use your electorate, use your vote. The franchise is important. Hi, Dr. Lewis. Um, actually, I was just going to follow up on a question that was just asked, which is, um, you know, a lot of the changes that came in the civil rights movement were through sort of legal mechanisms to address in inequities in education. And I guess um, one question I would have is what role do you think, um, you know, we have a group of young lawyers here that are all going to go and be part of the system. How do you think they can help to address some, some of the difficult tasks that need to be addressed in K-12 as well as in higher education? So that's a, not knowing how representative this group is in terms of your aspirations and what sectors of the law you actually intend to, uh, and areas you intend to practice. Let me say this, I think there are certain ways that you can intervene. You can intervene at the local level by serving on various agencies and boards and that indeed affect the ways in which people uh, actually live their lives. Uh, that's very, very important. You can intervene in the ways you actually help craft bills. Uh, and the degree to which uh, those bills themselves reflect a broader ethical concern uh, for the least among us as well as the best off among us. And there's a real tension sometimes in the system. Um, I think the other part is actually to engage in a conversation that to make sure that no graduate of the Emory Law School is ever able to leave this place without saying that he or she has a commitment to lead in whatever area they can lead. And then that means then, in the language that I have sort of created, 
that to be an Emory Law School graduate is to believe yourself as a citizen scholar. Uh, that is, you have used your learning here to go and affect, in a positive way, change in the greater world. If you leave in nothing else, then there's real commitment to being a citizen scholar. That you're using your learning to affect positively change for the world. Then I think we're taking one giant step forward. Provost Lewis, um, I'm really grateful for uh, the fact that you brought up um, that the affirmative action cases recently are essentially tabling the real question of race and opportunity. And I think that the frustration that a lot of people feel when they're discussing affirmative action programs is they don't know how th those programs relate back to the goal of equality. And I was wondering if you could comment on what you think the best frameworks are for really bringing the question of race and opportunity back into the discussion, if it's through affirmative action or th really through bringing up other topics? I think it's multi-pronged. Um, for those of you who realize, I'm, I'm a product of education in the South. I was born in Virginia, uh, went to segregated schools until I was in the 10th grade. And so I represent that transitional generation. Uh, 10 years of segregated schools, three years of, of desegregated schools in Virginia. Uh, came to see what it meant to move from one environment uh, to another. And so on my face is sort of this recent sort of chapter in American life. I graduated from high school in 1974. Okay. I had been in desegregated environments from 1970 until at that point. In 1978 was Baki. The experiment with affirmative action was pretty short. <laughs> from 1970 to 1978, in effect, before the courts intervened and said, look, this is not to redress past wrongs. It really is about creating a diverse society. If you think of that, just think of those two sort of historical moments and you realize we had a pretty truncated period in which to wrestle over some of the thorniest issues. I mean, it seems a long way from, if you're looking now from 2003 or 2005 backwards to uh, 1978, but really it's that intervening period between 1970 and 1978 that most schools in the South desegregated. And there were longer battles, battles in the North. And so what I would end up saying is that here's one case where history does matter. Uh, the second piece is, is that what you want to go and begin to do is ask what questions about race and opportunity. Did Michigan make mistakes in the ways in which it formulated its class and using when it had the formula? I would say, yeah, we made mistakes. It was imperfect. And in some ways, in hindsight, we ended up saying, you know, what we should have done is had, uh, just for those who don't know, we gave an automatic 20 points in the 150 points if you were a member of the, one of the three protected classes. But well, we probably should have had a gradation there for your socioeconomic background. And so that if you were in one area, if you were, came from an impoverished background, then you got the full 20 points and then it, it slid down depending if you were my daughter and you got something else. Okay. Those are things that we knew in hindsight, but those are the kinds of questions we should be able to talk about as we try to devise, devise policy. I ask here, me in this case, people who tell me race doesn't matter. And I go, okay. So I asked a question, and I asked it in this audience. How many of you have ever played the racial guessing game? The racial guessing game. By that, when you're walking down the street, you see someone who looks ambiguous, and you're trying to figure out who they are and where they belong. <laughs> Every now and then, I get someone to tell me they never have, and, and they're amazing to me, uh, because I know I have. <laughs> and so and even in that subtle, insidious way, we are aware of race, and it plays a way in framing our relationships and the ways in which we approach people and the organization of the world. It's not said we're good or bad. It's the fact that we're socialized in a context. Our ability to deal with that socialization then means that we have to talk about the relationship to opportunity. So that's my long-winded answer to, uh, to your very, very important question. I hope it begins to answer it. Dr. Lewis, I want to preface this by saying I'm personally in favor of affirmative action, but um, there was a recent Stanford Law Review article by a UCLA, UCLA prof that posited uh, minorities admitted under affirmative action are actually hurt by it sure. because they end up disproportionately towards the bottom of their law school classes and lag behind in bar admissions, whereas if they were then admitted to lower tiered schools, they presumably do a lot better, self-esteem, success follows. How do you respond? I have read those uh, services studies like that. Um, I'm going to, if that's the case in the systematic at UCLA, was this UCLA or someplace else? 
If it's systematic at UCLA, then UCLA should actually probably try to figure out what it needs to do. I mean, if it's not preparing the students well enough to pass the bar, uh, that's a huge problem uh, for UCLA. If it has to do with sort of the quote unquote innate abilities of students, uh, then that one is always suspicious to me uh, because faculty get to play a role in selection of any class. If the over predominant factor is race, uh, then in what they're looking for, that's insidious and that's wrong and that's racist, uh, actually. And so I would call faculty colleagues, if you bring in someone that you have any doubts that cannot succeed in that environment, then you made a mistake. I mean, it's not the policy, it's the practice. And we end up condemning policies when people in themselves enacting those policies sometimes engage in the wrong practices. However, I also have seen other studies that show that um, individuals, when you try to use the predictors of LSAT and GPAs, are imperfect measures of whether or not an individual is going to be successful in that environment. And that's the same thing, too, for admissions to graduate school and to medical school. Now, before I would be able to answer in any formal way, I need to know a little bit more about the actual learning environment inside of this particular law school. Uh, but you know, I, you know, I, I hear the critics, and in some ways, if that's what they're doing, and they're doing it in a way just to get the numbers, uh, then it's wrong. I mean, part of what you want to do is to create a learning environment where everyone learns. The second piece of it, and then conclude here, Albert, is to, this is the kind of research that requires a longitudinal approach. I mean, where an individual happens to be in the first year of law school or the last year of law school is sometimes different than where they are 10, 15 years out in terms of both their impact and, and, their cost, and their, um, the, the degree to which they're actually being able to serve a broader society. And so a snapshot approach only tells you a little bit. I was just at a meeting at Stony Brook where uh, Professor Cole, a sociologist, had very similar data. And um, I had a series of questions about what they meet, those data meant in the long run, so anyway. And, and, and my goal here, and I should just note, and I know that's not what you meant, and my goal hopefully is the question about affirmative action, in my view, is about public policy. I mean, it really is about what's the best policy here and whether or not it makes some sense from where for this particular point in time, and uh, not to convince you whether or not it's a good policy or a bad policy, it's whether or not it's a workable policy. Uh, can someone tell us what the uh, admission equation is in Emory Law School? Do we have a uh, number? And is it different from the admission equation in the graduate school and the college? I couldn't begin to tell you what you do at the law school, but I, I defer to anyone else uh, here. Um, and clearly, I think at the, at the graduate level, and, and what they end up doing, each individual student is reviewed, and each file is reviewed by a group of faculty in the individual schools and depart I mean, departments and programs. They make the determination in the end whether or not that student is a good fit uh, for that particular program in that particular year, usually in context, that is, they, as compared to a, that particular pool. At the undergraduate level, there's the Central Admissions Office that looks at a variety of fa factors, including GPA, uh, AP courses, um, standing in class, special projects, athletic and, and other kinds of talents, um, LSAT, not, uh, but SAT or ACT scores, et cetera, and then um, you fall into certain quadrants. I appreciate the law school has kept silence on this. But even on the, in the graduate school and in the college, that doesn't sound like a pro-diversity program in any organized sense of the word. OK, I, I, I hear your point. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Um, you talked about how diversity would lead to intellectual diversity. At my alma mater, Williams College, um, I recently read in, the, read in the Wall Street Journal a uh, uh, survey 53 out of 53 professors responding identify themselves as Democrats. Um, so if the intellectual diversity is a true goal of uh, colleges and <laughs> universities, and you know, Williams is in liberal Massachusetts, it might be a little extreme, but I'm not sure it's that extreme as you know, universities go. They tend to be more to the left. Is that, um, is that kind of intellectual diversity something that universities are looking at? Uh, insofar as I know, yes. And no, that is, I mean, and let me start with the no part. Insofar as I know, there's no faculty committee, and I certainly not from my office, do we ask anyone their political affiliation uh, when they're being considered for a job. In fact, I actually would find that a little queasy, actually, to begin asking people, in part because of the 1950s. When I 
when I joined the uh, University of California faculty in 1984, I still had to sign a loyalty oath. It was held over from the McCarthy era. And so there are a lot of institutions still dealing with the fact that there was a period not that long ago in American higher education where you had to engage in behavior and sign oaths that place you on one side or another of a political spectrum in a, in a set of political possibilities. As a result, I think most of us engage in a series of other conversations rather than the square one, are you Republican, are you Democrat, are you independent, are you socialist, are you something else? Okay. 53 out of how many faculty at Williams? And so that means this was self-selecting as well, that there was something about the range of faculty who responded. So as a survey in this methodology question, I would want to make sure that you have to survey the whole population to make sure that indeed of 47 who responded didn't fall into some other sort of range of political beliefs. And even then, so that's the second piece. Third piece is, is that because one has a democratic label, if you're a member of the Democratic Party, that covers a lot of people and a, a range of attitudes, and so I'm not sure that I would conclude from that particular one variable that there was not intellectual diversity uh, in those myths. Uh, if you think uh, of Senator Lieberman on one end of a spectrum, Ted Kennedy on another, they aren't quite the same people, the same party, uh, not quite the same people. So, so part of it is how we, as, just as research, how we begin to phrase the question and to get it. Now get into your question of do we look at it and should we, should we look at it. Clearly trying to figure out how to maintain intellectual diversity is important. There are ways of doing it. One way is the who are the professors. Another way is actually to invite people in and in the ways in which we expand the conversation by inviting a variety of viewpoints inside of the institution to debate and talk. And so if we, if we aren't able to achieve in the short run your goal and my goal of intellectual diversity by who we sit in the classroom, uh, who, who's an instructor, we can do it in other ways. And, and that's where students actually get to play a role. You get to play a role in helping to form and shape the speaker series and other kinds of activities. Thank you. Dr. Lewis, I'm really interested in, in what you call diversity fatigue. And yeah. I wonder to what degree that is uh, betraying a change in personal and categorical constructions of race as one's identity. Is it because individually we just don't think that race is that important to us? I think it's, it's a little bit of both. I think it's, it's individual that for some, in the, for some of us at this particular point in time, we like to be sort of beyond race as a problem and a reality. We like to believe that we carry into the 21st century new problems and not the problems of the 20th or the 19th century and somehow we can get beyond race. And so if you end up looking at surveys of young people, 13 to 17, they will talk in transracial categories in some instances in terms of clothes, music, friendships, relationships, et cetera. And those are real uh, in, in some ways. If you talk about institutions, however, and how institutions be uh, organized in the ways in which we count. I mean, for lawyers, I mean, and I was having this conversation, for lawyers, how do you measure change in society if you don't have categories? How do you ensure that you're protecting categories, individuals who belong to certain categories if you don't label them? And so in the process of labeling it in and of itself, you come back then to the dynamic and the tension here between some who would rather it be over, some who said, yeah, but we can't measure progress until we can categorize. And so inside of this institution, Emory is an example. We could have diversity, and we can do that and measure it by the number of people of different backgrounds who are here. But that's diversity in sort of the pure sense that is we can count the number of different people. That doesn't necessarily create a diverse community. And so part of the challenge in all of this is then talking about institutions and the things that we put in, recognizing that institutional development becomes a critical part to sustainability. Uh, individual accounts, individual actions don't always amount to sustainable actions. Thank you, Professor. Um, Provost, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Michigan. When I was accepted in 1998, there was a major focus on diversity and its marketing strategy. How has the consequences of these decisions affected that strategy since then? Marketing strategy, you say? That's correct. Okay. I don't, that's an interesting question. I, if you, and I don't know how to measure it, so let, let's talk about it for a second. Sure. Um, because if you look at the numbers of students of color, if that's one aspect of diversity, the numbers declined last year uh, at Michigan and a number of other institutions immediately after the uh, Grotz and Gruder case. 
in part because people worried about the environment that they were going to live in, whether or not the institution had responded by developing new opportunities uh, for a variety of students, um, majority and minority. If you look at it in, in terms of then the lived experience, where people live and what they encounter on the ground, then there's something else. There are indeed new programs that have been put in place. Michigan just received a grant from the Ford Foundation to create a new center for institutional diversity. Uh, which they're actually working with uh, other universities around the country to try to figure out how we institutionalize it so it's not just there. And so that piece of marketing where you're actually putting something that will be sustainable is sort of moving it to the next level. I mean, but let me make sure I'm understanding by marketing. I mean, and how the brochures that are out there and the ways in which one attracts undergraduates and, and, and all, uh, that's always part of the ways that we all want to recognize. How do we get the smartest young people to come to our institution? I mean, at the University of Michigan, uh, there was 22,000 applicants uh, for the 4,000 seats. And so part of the overall strategy was making sure that you can create an environment uh, where the most attractive students would see themselves fitting into that community. And so there's that piece of marketing uh, uh, as well. Um, but is that getting at part of the question you're posing? I want to make sure I didn't lose your question. No, absolutely. Thank you very much. And go blue. <laughs> <laughs>